Welcome to this special Gastro Girl podcast. This episode was produced in collaboration with the American College of Gastroenterology's Patient Care Committee. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Well, hello everyone and happy new year. Happy 2022. It's almost fitting that we're talking about this topic today, GERD. A lot of us may feel a little bit of weirdness because we maybe ate too much or ate the wrong things over the holidays, but it's a really important topic. We're going to be talking about the ACG, the American College of Gastroenterology's new clinical guideline on the diagnosis and management of gastroesophageal reflux disease, otherwise known as GERD. And this is a really important topic. Um, GERD continues to be among the most common diseases seen by gastroenterologists, surgeons, and primary care physicians, according to the authors of this new guideline. And our understanding of the varied presentations of GERD, the enhancements in diagnostic testing, and the approach to patient management have certainly evolved. What's so great about today's podcast is we're talking about a guideline that hasn't been updated since 2013. And there's a lot that's been happening over the last eight years in this area of uh, GI and the clinical research that involves GERD. So now there's new guidance and the ACG led by Dr. Philip Katz um, has developed this new guide guidance for diagnosing, treating and managing GERD. And today we are thrilled to welcome back the amazing duo of Dr. Tasif Ali and Dr. Pooja Singhal, who are both leading gastroenterologists and colleagues at SSM Health St. Anthony Hospital in Oklahoma. Now, Dr. Ali is chair of the Public Relations Committee of the ACG, and Dr. Singhal is also a key member of this ACG committee. Now, the ACG PR committee has a very important role in helping to educate and inform providers and their patients about key issues in GI, and they really do a great job of providing the latest updates and advances in gastroenterology. That's why we've invited them back to help us understand the latest ACG clinical guideline on the diagnosis and management of GERD. So welcome, Dr. Ali and Dr. Singhal. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be back here and uh, with, with another exciting um, event talking about um, acid reflux, its management, and some key points from the guidelines. So we need to have some experts break this down for us, because according to the study authors, over the past eight years, our under, understanding of GERD has certainly changed a lot. And one of the biggest um, and controversial topics is the use of PPIs in treating GERD. And Dr. Ali and Dr. Singhal are going to break it down for us today and answer all of our questions. So let's get started, everyone. So uh, first of all, yes. what is GERD and what are the symptoms and causes and who's at risk? Just give us a little 101 on GERD. Acid reflux um, affect about 20% of Western uh, population. Um, it's, it's prevalent here and uh, typically patient uh, present with um, heartburn, regurgitation. These are the typical symptoms of acid reflux or uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. Um, it happens for many reasons. One of the common reason is when the junction where your food pipe and your stomach meets, it's called esophageal gastric junction. And there is a barrier, there's a sphincter there. And if there is uh, impairment or poor functioning of that uh, junction, uh, it can lead to um, uh, impaired reflux or the clearance of that reflux that happened in the food pipe, and that can produce and can cause uh, symptoms that can be quite disturbing to us. That's kind of like uh, the basic idea about GERD, and uh, we'll see if Dr. Singhal has anything else to add to this. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jackie, for inviting us back. Uh, Happy New Year. And um, you both are absolutely right. This is such an important topic. I completely agree with Dr. Ali. I would like to mention something that I have noted in my experience. One of the uh, one of the key distinctions that I want to want people to know is good is um, objective phenomenon, like Dr. Ali talked about. So it's the reflux of what's in the stomach, gastric contact, 
contents into the esophagus, but it manifests in clinical symptoms as heartburn. So you feel burning sensation coming from the top of your uh, stomach, which is right under the breastbone, all the way up to having sore throat and burning in the chest. And the reason why I mention this is a lot of times I will have referrals for GERD or heartburn. And when I, when I ask patients, oh, do you have heartburn? They'll say, no, I don't have heartburn. I have GERD. They don't understand that we're referring to the same disease process and heartburn is simply a symptom that characterizes GERD and vice versa. So I did want to, I did want to put it out there that this is a spectrum of the same disease and that's important to realize. And like Dr. Ali said, it's defined by heartburn and regurgitation. I'm happy to talk about the guidelines um, regarding diagnosis of um, GERD. Since GERD is such a common, common disease, um, and um, the guidelines suggest if somebody comes in with classic symptoms, so the classic symptoms would be heartburn and regurgitation, and they have no other concerning symptoms, which we refer to as red signs or alarm symptoms. Those would be like difficulty swallowing, food getting stuck in the chest or esophagus, pain with swallowing, low blood counts. If they don't have any of that and they have just heartburn or, or food coming up without any effort in the esophagus, which is called regurgitation, the recommendation is that we give them a trial of PPI, which is called proton pump inhibitor. So commonly known as medications, pantoprazole, Nexium, which is esomeprazole, omeprazole, which is also known as Prilosec, so that those medications are in category of PPI. So that's the recommendation, a trial, eight week trial of PPI once, once daily. And it's recommended that we take that 30 to 60 minutes before meals. And that's really important because oftentimes people take this medication right before they sleep. So they've had their dinner. It's studies have shown that it's most effective uh, 30 minutes to 60 minutes before. And uh, so that's that's one of the most common ways to approach GERD. Yeah, and uh, um, um, I will add to this, um, uh, to Dr. Singhal, uh, that there are uh, certain other symptoms uh, that are called extra esophageal symptoms, where patients can also present with uh, symptoms such as hoarseness, throat clearing, chronic cough, uh, conditions like pharyngitis, laryngitis, and we'll talk about this, that how guidelines address those things. But I think you raised a very important point that patients who are having classic symptoms of acid reflux, heartburn, regurgitation, no alarm symptoms, they don't need to have an endoscopy. They can go to this empiric treatment of eight week trial of PPI uh, before meals to see if that helps and, 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 and then see if this is helping their uh, symptoms and uh, problems. Well, that was a great overview of what GERD is. And I love the fact that you clarified because we always hear heartburn, acid reflux, GERD, and it's confusing. So thank you for laying out the, you know, how that all relates. That's really important. So let's back up a little bit because we have some really good uh, points to talk about in the new guideline. But for those of us who might not know, what is a guideline, uh, a clinical guideline, and why are the ACG clinical guidelines so important for providers and patients? So guideline itself, uh, if the word guideline means it's, it's a statement that determines the, the course of action. Uh, a medical guideline is a document that help us guide, make medical decisions. It put forward certain criteria that can be helpful in diagnosis, management, and treatment of a specific area. Um, and uh, these documents have been there for for for, for a long, long time. Um, and that brings up this the, the need to update those guidelines as our science evolve, as our understanding evolve, and as more studies are done on the subject, throwing different um, um, understanding, 
in terms of why we get a disease, why we have the problem, and how do we best manage that. So remember, these are guidelines. They are guiding us. Um, and sometimes you have to individualize an approach also. But in general, these guidelines help us develop and streamline the process um, of taking care of a patient in the best possible way. And guidelines are typically developed by societies, by expert uh, physicians, researchers, and clinicians um, based on the currently available evidence. So that also tells you that these guidelines um, need to be updated with time because as the evidence come forward with new studies, your previous recommendations or your previous um, uh, consensus statements or suggestions uh, may change with time. So that's kind of like where, what the guidelines mean. And, and if you look at the GERD guidelines put forward by American College of Gastroenterology, uh, they have been updated after many years. And, and uh, we have understood a lot about uh, different aspects of diagnosing, managing the risk of the management, uh, medical therapy risks, as well as we also understood of the surgical endoscopic treatment that may be available to our patients. That's, it's so great. And it's so important to note that these are rigorous review processes. They look at a lot of science, a lot of data. So that's why they oftentimes take so long is because they have to look at a lot of, of evidence and really understand and offer their insights and uh, medical knowledge. So this is, um, I'm really excited to talk about guidelines because I, I, I think they get underappreciated, especially in the patient population because we don't know, like how, do our, how does our doctor make those decisions? And that brings you to my next question. How do providers use these guidelines? And you kind of answered that a little bit, but how do patients benefit from these guidelines? You both have very uh, articulated it so well, the importance of guidelines. I think um, it is very well used by primary care providers and specialists of all, not only gastroenterologists, but surgeons as well. How we benefit is because these guidelines come from review of all the evidence, all the studies related on single topics. So for example, if we were to talk about the use of sucralfate or baclofen, as like medical therapies, which are known and kind of talked about, what is the real evidence regarding that? And what I love about the guidelines is they, those are the documents that dissect everything. So they not only review it, but they say, okay, well, this, this study, for example, does not adequately support, um, support this. So there is a study out there, but the, the results were uh, equivocal. So there is not a benefit shown over the other pharmacologic agent or surgical agent or long-term yeah. side effect of PPI. And that's very, very important as we deal with a very prevalent disease like GERD that can lead to uh, serious complications. So it is truly a guidance to providers um, as to uh, direct their practice and care of patients. Thank you for that insight. Uh, both of you have provided some great insight on the guidelines. Now we're going to get into the good stuff. Now we're going to get into the guideline itself. So, you know, I, I know it opened up when you read the guidelines, it talks about one of the first things is the diagnosis of GERD. So from the guidelines, and you can divide up the conversation and the insights however you want. Uh, but what are the key insights from the guidelines for the diagnosis of GERD? And just take us through some of the key points. I think we kind of started to delve into this and I'll come back. So the, the first and foremost, there's no gold standard for the diagnosis of GERD. So it is a combination of clinical symptoms, presentation, pharmacologic um, response to the symptoms. So as I mentioned before, classic symptoms of GERD, heartburn and regurgitation. If somebody comes in with heartburn and regurgitation, eight weeks, um, eight weeks trial of uh, PPI is very important. So PPI, again, are medications like isomeprazole, pentaprazole, omeprazole that we've all heard about. And they're very important because they reduce the gastric acid secre secretion in the stomach and neutralize it. So that's how they help the symptoms of GERD. And that's the first, uh, uh, first recommendation is we diagnose uh, GERD by response 
um, to this medication for eight weeks. If they have no other symptoms, um, alarm symptoms. So classic symptoms, uh, heartburn, regurgitation, we do eight weeks trial. If they respond to it, wonderful. And then we try, uh, if the symptom resolution is great, then we try to take them off of these medication. Uh, if the patient does not respond to uh, proton pump inhibitor medication, then for diagnosis, endoscopy is recommended. And endoscopy is the upper endoscopy, which is when we take a thin endoscope, um, usually when the patient is asleep, and go down the throat, look in the esophagus, and what we're looking for is mucosal injury, evidence of mucosal injury, um, which is called esophagitis, or evidence of chronic mucosal injury, which is called Barrett's esophagus. So that's kind of the initial diagnostic steps, and I'll see um, if Dr. Ali wants to discuss the other symptoms and how we diagnose. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, that's that's great. I will just add uh, that the guidelines uh, do recommend that when you do endoscopy, you stop the PPI, ideally for two to four weeks, uh, so that you can um, um, you can see all these damages that Dr. Singhal was just mentioning, the esophagitis and Barrett's esophagus. Um, Patients who have atypical symptoms such as chest pain um, uh, and they're not having any heartburn, they're just having chest pain and they're having other uh, and they have been excluded for um, heart problems and cardiac diseases, uh, then uh, they need to have testing done to confirm that they are having um, acid reflux and that would then include endoscopy. Sometimes you have to include other testing that we can talk about later is all reflux monitoring, where you can actually uh, do some tests uh, and perform some tests to see the actual reflux and see if this is an acidic reflux, if this is an acid reflux causing them to have, the, to have these symptoms. So when you have alarm symptoms, as Dr. Singhal was mentioning, that you go ahead and perform an endoscopy and look for those um, uh, damages. What these guidelines are important is that just to make the diagnosis of acid reflux, you do not have to undergo high resolution manometry. You don't have to do the uh, reflux monitoring test just to diagnose the GERD. Um, and um, so you, you either diagnose GERD with classic symptoms of heartburn, regurgitation, or you perform endoscopy and you see the evidence of the damage. And then these tests that we just mentioned about manometry, reflux monitoring, do have their role, but not in diagnosing patients with acid reflux. Now, could acid reflux or GERD be a symptom of something else that's going on? And how do you, and I don't know if that's in the guideline, but it's just, you know, it may be a question that some patients may have, like, is it, you know, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, I have this, keep having this, this GERD, but it's, you know, the PPIs aren't helping. Is there something else going on? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It can. It can be associated with other diseases like gastroparesis, which is decreased motility of the food, of the stomach. So the food is sitting in the stomach and you uh, automatically have a lot of reflux. It could be because of eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, so there are multiple of diseases that can cause secondary GERD. Absolutely. But these guidelines are specifically addressing the initial onset or the, you know, the, when they're presenting to their doctor and they're trying to figure out what's going on. This is talking about diagnosing GERD. Absolutely. The guidelines do mention about, uh, uh, Jackie, as you mentioned, some atypical symptoms and conditions. Um, uh, we talked about the chest pain, and then um, they, there are other uh, symptoms also, like chronic cough, uh, dysphonia, their voices change, asthma. Sometimes um, they, these patients go to the ear, nose, throat specialist, and they are then referred to us uh, to rule out acid reflux. But we just need to remember, and the guidelines do make a statement about that these symptoms and conditions, they have a very poor sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of GERD. Um, so diagnosis of GERD by extra esophageal symptoms alone or by their response to PPI are unreliable because of the poor sensitivity and the specificity. 
Um, so, so you just have to be very careful when you're just saying that. So it's, it could be, it go either way. You can have these extra esophageal symptoms that are secondary to GERD, or you can have totally a different disease process that is causing you to have uh, these uh, symptoms. So you just have to have a very thorough investigation. So what I do want to send a message out is that patients who are having chronic cough or throat clearing or, or, or symptoms that are suggesting of chest pain and asthma, don't just blame it to acid reflux. It could be something else going on. And if ev ev everything else has ruled out, then yes, acid reflux contributing to these symptoms need to be um, uh, kept in mind. Yeah, thank you both for clarifying that. I think that's important for patients to know. Thank you so much. Is there anything else uh, for the diagnosis of GERD that patients should be aware of from the, um, the guidelines? The only other thing I would just add is esophagram or barium uh, radiation. Barium radiography is no longer the first line diagnostic um, modalities. So we do not, uh, the guidelines do not recommend to use that solely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with that. And we sometimes see patients, especially coming from their primary care physicians, family physicians, um, that they get the barium swallow as a diagnostic test uh, for GERD. But th this guideline um, uh, make a recommendation that this is not a um, recommended test uh, or a first line test. Uh, to diagnose um, acid reflux. Great. Now, is diet anywhere in in there? Because I, you know, just naturally, patients always wonder about that. Um, so, for patients who, you know, they they haven't been eating great, especially maybe over the holidays, alcohol. We we know some of the triggers to that heartburn, fried food, pizza, tomato sauce, whatever that is that may trigger a patient. Is that anywhere? Like you know, avoiding a food for a certain amount of time, is that in the guideline anywhere or? Absolutely, and that's a very nice segue to the guidelines in terms of GERD management, actually. So diet and lifestyle changes are very much in the recommendation. So the trigger foods, avoidance of trigger foods is definitely strongly recommended. And I will just give my, my little spiel that I used to use, my mnemonic, this is not in the guidelines, but this is the mnemonic that I love to use, is uh, the six C's. Avoid the foods with the six C's. So the C stands for carbonated drinks. So that would include the soda, uh, chocolate, cigarette smoking, uh, which is in the guideline. Avoiding tobacco products and tobacco abuse is very important. Curry and spices um, is also very important um, to avoid. And uh, citrus foods, uh, so berries. A lot of times berries have a lot of acid food, any kind of citrusy foods. Um, and I think that was, I think that was six. Did I cover six? Maybe um, I think that's, that's five, five. Those are my groups of that I recommend. Wow, you're just taking away all the fun, Dr. Singhal. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now with all the, you know, those salsa waters, everything's carbonated. Yeah. I, have you guys seen an increased incidence, you know, in the popularity of those carbonated beverages with um, increase in acid reflux? Uh, that inversely uh, is related to my popularity with the patient, especially when I make these guide, uh, when I make these <laughs> recommendations around holidays, so. I bet. <laughs> so I can talk about the non-seas uh, foods. Um, so fatty meals, um, um, sometimes, um, so the guidelines do recommend that avoiding fatty meals, uh, so high fat meals, um, uh, is also important when you are uh, making some lifestyle uh, modifications um, and um, smaller portions of meals. Um, that is also important. Um, and um, as Dr. Singhal was mentioning about um, eating uh, the, the, the trigger foods, uh, we also need to remember that uh, we need to avoid heavy meals uh, two to three hours before going to bed. So I typically ask my patients, what time do you go to bed? And then I just count three hours back and tell them that that should be your last meal of the day. In Western culture, typically our heaviest or biggest meal is at the end of the day. Um, and and that, that sometimes do contribute to acid reflux, especially nighttime symptoms. So I think uh, educating patients uh, that 
this concept is very important and it does make it into the guidelines. The guidelines do recommend um, avoiding meals uh, within two to three hours of bedtime. And I'll just add a few other things since we are on the topic of lifestyle modification um, uh, about diet, that there are some certain other things that the guidelines do talk about and recommend. Um, so one recommendation is weight loss in overweight and obese patients for the improvement of GERD symptoms. Uh, and then we talked about the suggestion about elevating the head uh, of the bed uh, to relieve the nighttime symptoms, uh, taking your medications, uh, PPI, 30 to 60 minutes uh, before meals. Uh, so these are general recommendations. And then one other interesting thing is the um, sleeping uh, on the left side, avoiding to sleep on the right side. Um, it does make it into the recommendation. There is there's a very nice table uh, in the guidelines that summarize all these things and tell us whether these are recommendable uh, lifestyle modification or not. So most of the discussions that we had, actually, it, these are all recommendable um, uh, recommendations or modifications, except there is one very interesting one is uh, the avoiding alcoholic beverages. Um, the guidelines do say that, there is, that the evidence is weak and Generally, it's not recommended. Uh, I don't want to bluntly say that, okay, now you can just go and enjoy your alcoholic beverages. Uh, in many patients, uh, drinking alcohol would cause them to have increased symptoms. It's just that we don't have that much of evidence in the science uh, to make a very strong recommendations because there are patients who can consume uh, a, a very moderate or social, uh, socially they can drink and can tolerate that without having um, worsening of their symptoms. So, so I love this, um, the recommendations on the chart. So what, um, what are the top, what got the most or the highly recommended that there was a lot of evidence behind management? Um, what were the key ones for the, you know, the best way to manage GERD? Was it um, the PPIs still? Yeah, so it's a combination. The strong uh, recommendation was definitely weight loss um, in uh, overweight and obese patients and, and um, treatment with pharmacologic therapy, more specifically PPIs over H2 receptor antagonists in patients with erosive esophagitis. So that's an important thing to realize if there was a diagnostic EGD done and they had evidence of erosive esophagitis, they definitely had strong evidence for recommendation for PPIs uh, for both tre initial treatment and maintenance of erosive esophagitis. Um, they also, and I think I alluded to this before and Dr. Ali also mentioned this, yeah. there's a common misconception of taking PPI or medication right before going to sleep. But really the recommendation is that PPIs uh, medications should be taken 30 to 60 minutes before a meal rather than at bedtime. And there was, um, you know, that was also emphasized. Yeah. That's key information for patients for sure, because they may not be taking it at the right time. They're not responding to that treatment protocol and they're wondering why. So that's a great point to for patients and maybe discussing that with their physician. One thing uh, that is a message I want to give out, and it's it, it probably a message to even our colleagues and primary care physicians that when you're looking at the recommendation, there are two words that are used. One is recommendation. And then one word is suggestion. You will see that uh, going back and forth, like we recommend this or we suggest this. Uh, so recommendation is based on strong evidence. Uh, suggestion is made on conditional um, evidence. So, uh, so we have to be very careful about how these words are used in the guidelines. These are based on quality of evidence, risk benefits, um, the costs, um, and certain other factors. No, this is okay. This is great because patients yeah. should really understand this. And I think, you know, we have a lot of well read patients and they look at the guidelines. So even for them looking at it and seeing recommended and suggested yeah, for them to understand, because there is no one size fits all, like something may be suggested, but it may work for a patient if they discuss that with their physician yeah. first. It's not like yeah. we want them to go and try these things, but you definitely want to take this information, right, Dr. Arley, and bring it to your physician and ask about it. Cause it may, it may be something that works for you, even though there's not a ton of evidence showing that it's a high recommendation. That's okay. We had this, like we talked about earlier with the low FODMAP diet years ago, 
there wasn't at the time it wasn't a lot of evidence but it was very um helpful and it and it really diminished the symptoms in ibs patients but now the the, the science has caught up to that and it's high recommend recommended as first line so this is a great example of that yeah for example i just uh, uh was looking at the guidelines that uh the guideline says that we recommend weight loss we recommend taking ppi uh 30 to 60 minutes before meals but then the guideline says that we suggest on demand or intermittent ppi for heartburn symptoms in patients who have non erosive reflux disease uh, meaning when they have the symptoms but their endoscopy is normal um, so so these patients may use on demand or intermittent ppi so so there that that's a suggestion so we don't have a very strong evidence about that but the the authors the experts suggest that we may consider that as well as the recommendations are weight loss, avoiding meals for the hours before bedtime, and taking your PIs 30 to 60 minutes uh, before uh, meals. So, you know, again, we're going to bring up uh, PPIs because there's, it's, they get a bad rap and it's confusing for patients. We hear all the different studies that look at PPIs and bone loss, PPIs and colon cancer. I mean, they've done everything. So, I don't know if the guidelines can provide any insight or if there's something that we could take away from the guidelines on PPIs. What is the download? What is the, the word on PPIs from this? What do patients really need to understand? Do you, are they supposed to be on PPIs like every single day? You talked about on demand, you know, is it when they have symptoms? Like what, how can patients really make sense of this? Actually, the guidelines very nice. A, a summary statement. And um, what I think what I will do is I will just read out that summary statement because it's so nicely written. Uh, It's under one of the key concepts of long-term PPI issues uh, under the guidelines. It says that regarding the safety of long-term PPI usage for acid reflux, uh, we suggest the patient should be advised as follows. Uh, And it goes like this, that PPIs are most effective medical treatment for acid reflux. Some medical studies have identified an association, so the keyword is association, between long-term use of PPI and development of numerous adverse conditions. And then it gives you a list of those adverse conditions, such as pneumonia, stomach cancer, osteoporosis, kidney problems, uh, dementia, strokes, and more recently, just a few months ago, the study published showing that IBD, uh, patients can get IBD with PPI. So these are all associations. And then the authors go on saying that um, these studies have flaws, uh, are not considered definitive, and do not establish cause and effect relationship between PPI and the adverse conditions. So these are just associations. They may even have flaws, and they are not definitive uh, um, cause and effect relationship. There is no cause and effect relationship between PPIs causing these problems. And high quality studies have actually discovered that PPIs do not significantly increase uh, the risk of any of these conditions except uh, intestinal infections. Nevertheless, the authors mentioned that they cannot exclude the possibilities of PPI might confer a small increase in these adverse conditions, But for the most part, and for the treatment of GERD, gastroenterologists generally agree that there's a well-established benefits of PPI outweighing any theoretical risk. So I think that they just summarize it so beautifully that I thought I just need to read that out and give a little bit of my input on it. I really appreciated the authors uh, wording it so nicely because it makes absolute sense. And this is one very controversial topic, very well covered in media that there are questions. There are a lot of questions. In fact, uh, during the pandemic, I had a few patients who just stopped PPIs and came to me with then presentation with dysphagia and a couple of patients, you know, did have pretty severe disease. They had stricture disease. One patient had malignancy, which developed over years and years of neglected uh, symptoms of GERD. But my point is, if um, people should really talk to their 
providers and specialists before discontinuing a medication. And I think it's a very, very good to advocate for yourself and ask the questions. And like Dr. Ali said, the key here is there is no causality that has been established. Right. And that's what I tell my patients. You know, we know there are certain drugs that cause side effects. I, I do a lot of liver disease management as well. And I know the drugs where I need to monitor liver enzymes, you know, and in this specifically, if there are no no other risk factors. Like if, if somebody does not already have existing osteoporosis or B12 deficiency, they don't even recommend for supplementation of calcium vitamin D in a normal average person. So I think, I think this is very coming to what you, we had started this podcast with, how are these guidelines important? I think when it comes to PPIs and the statement, I think it's very, very helpful in guidelines guidance of management all around. 100% agree. That's why I was kind of pushing a little bit and trying to showcase. We don't know. It could be individualized on a, on a case-by-case basis. So, so to make an, or to assume a sweeping thing, like, okay, everyone has to stop this is, is not accurate. And that's why to talk to your physician patients, to, you know, understand the research, not take it in, and implement it in your own health journey, because it may not be right for you, and ask your doctor about it. And, you know, where can patients find the guidelines? Um, you know, they're helpful to look at. There's some news articles out there about it. You can find them on the, the ACG site, gi.org, under, is it under education and then guidelines? And they should be open, right? It's open access. It is open access. All you have to do is Google ACG guidelines on any topic. And I think yeah. All of them are open, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so the guidelines. So if you go to gi.org, click on education, and there's like guidelines, and you should be able to do that. Or like Dr. Singhal said, you can do a Google search. We'll also put them on GI On Demand Gastro Girl site so you can access them as well. Um, so, you know, I think we already answered this, but maybe we could sum, sum it up. What are the key takeaways for patients from what we present, from what you both presented here this evening? And if there's anything new in the guideline that patients should talk to their doctors about um, as it relates to their own health, individual health journey. The takeaway for me uh, that I am going to ex- um, discuss this with my patients and educate my patients. Um, number one, identifying patients with acid reflux, with heartburn and regurgitation. Also understanding there could be extra esophageal symptoms. Uh, giving them a therapy empirically two months, eight weeks, um, and, and that, that's very important so that when we are writing our prescription, we make sure that we are not writing it for like four months or three months, six refills on it, and just totally forgetting about that we put our patients on PPI and now they're taking it long term. Uh, so giving it a trial of eight weeks or two months, um, and if they're better after that, they can stop it. Um, and uh, so, so that that's important, uh, the uh, kind of like a definite duration, then how to take it and what are the other lifestyle modifications that they have to practice, that's important. Um, and then a minimal possible uh, dose, uh, taking it empty stomach, that's important. Uh, that's the key thing. Um, I also learned that um, how we can explain to our patients the long-term safety um, issues with PPI that does not negate some of the side effects that they can still get with PPI. Some patients do get, um, headaches and diarrhea and some other symptoms with PPI. And then the guidelines do make some recommendations about how to manage those. And if you want to switch a PPI, you can do that. Um, the guidelines also help me understand that patients who are having their acid reflux that is becoming refractory, that there are some options for them in terms of surgery, some endoscopic uh, options for them. So that, that was important that uh, patients who do not want to use PPI for long term, they are still concerned despite my reassurances to them, I can present and give them some options alternatively. Um, the guidelines do mention about uh, the the ruin the gastric bypass surgery for those who are overweight and obese. That's uh, how it can also help. Oh, really interesting. So, so that that was all um, um, takeaway from uh, from these guidelines for me. And I love the fact that you keep mentioning lifestyle changes, and I know Dr. Singhal too, because often that's 
you know, it's, it's so obvious, but yeah, it might be overlooked because we might want to immediately try a ther- like a therapeutic or a pharmaceutical or over the counter product when basic things that we didn't even think about relate to that. So I love that you guys both mentioned that. So Dr. Singel, anything that you'd like to add about key takeaways for patients and how they could talk, what should they should talk to their doctors about? Absolutely. Thank you. So I think Dr. Ali summarized the key key points really well. I would just say, based on my experience, I would definitely like to emphasize, and that's also emphasized in the guidelines, if the response to the symptoms are not adequate, the classic symptoms, heartburn and regurgitation, don't just stop the follow-up. It's important to discover and do further testing by EGD. And also, if that's refractory, then going on to pH and impedance t- testing. Because when you stop a, stop the follow-up and ignore the symptoms, that's when there is a high chance of complications. The other um, thing that uh, we have talked about but not clearly said is the risk factors. Ma- Caucasian male greater than 55 year old old that has chronic symptoms of GERD more than five years. So a heartburn, um, you know, regurgitation, definitely should bring that up with the primary care provider because that needs to be further evaluated because then they become at risk for Barrett's esophagus, uh, which is the chronic mucosal injury. Um, So that's something that I would like to highlight and it's definitely mentioned in guidelines to make sure that those patients are on pharmacologic treatment and also are working towards um, good lifestyle changes so they can lose weight. Um, So that's what I would add to that. Well, this has been great. Both of you are so insightful. There's so many more topics we could talk about. Barrett's esophagus is, an, is one, really understanding some of the um, surgical ways of weight loss. We did something earlier, but really understanding post-procedure and what someone has to do uh, to maintain um, you know, a healthy lifestyle beyond that. But So there's so many great things. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope our listeners um, have some key takeaways. Again, if you want to access the guideline, you can Google the ACG clinical guideline on GERD, or you can go to gi.org, look in the top bar for um, education, and then click on guidelines. And I believe it's the first one. It was published in November of 2021. So thank you both. I appreciate it. And here's to a healthy 2022. Thank you, Jackie, for your excellent work. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.